who eat, sleep, play, everything sleep. I'm here to welcome you today. I'm Tracy from SoCal Moms and Newbie Box and Eat, Sleep, Play and so many things. <laughs> but um, I'm excited to introduce you to two of our speakers today. Jenny June, our sleep extraordinaire expert um, and my personal go-to for my kids. So I'm really excited for you guys to get to know her today. Um, in a second, she's going to take over and tell you a little bit about herself and then jump right into what you need to know to get healthy sleep for your family. And she's going to talk about some of our common challenges. And when she's done giving you um, more information and her presentation, then she will be available here on main stage for questions. You can type your questions in the chat, which you should all be able to see on the right hand of your screen. Um, and we will get to them, but we're going to try and get through her presentation a little bit before we jump into questions. Jenny also has a booth. And if you need more in-depth help, um, that is the place to go. And she also has a free downloadable PDF related to the event um, and sleep courses and all kinds of things. So we recommend that once you finish with main stage, you're going to go to the expo hall, which is on the left side of your screen. And that's where you're going to find the booths and be able to get additional information. Also here with us today is Amrita from Kudos Diapers, and they are hosting a booth in our expo hall as well, um, which you'll see labeled as Kudos Diapers. And you can join them for a talk on why choosing the right diaper is important for sleep, <laughs> which a lot of us probably have had happen, those leaky diapers. I'm pretty sure I've had a few nights lately where I'm changing outfits and diapers and sheets and all kinds of things. Um, so they'll be there and they have a diaper giveaway as well, which we can all stock up on. So we recommend you go meet them there. And I'm going to give Jenny and Amrita each just a quick few minutes to introduce themselves and then we'll we'll jump into sleep. Uh, who wants to go first? Diapers first. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Diapers it is. Um, well, hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for having me here. Super excited to share um, all about Kudos Diapers. So I am the founder and CEO of Kudos Diapers. We, we are brand new. We just launched in June. Um, we are actually the first and only disposable diaper where your baby's bum touches 100% cotton all day not plastic, uh, believe it or not, with all other disposable diapers, and people don't know this because diapers are engineered to feel very soft, um, They are it's generally all plastic touching your baby's bum. With some of the eco-friendly ones, there's no added dyes and chemicals, but the actual material is fossil fuel derived plastic. So we're really here to get rid of as much plastic out of the diaper um, as we can. And a little bit about my background. My background is in mechanical engineering. I Started my career at Procter & Gamble, who makes uh, Pampers. Um, I left Procter & Gamble to start my first company in India called Sathi Pads, making biodegradable sanitary pads out of waste banana tree fiber. So I really do like to nerd out on all things material science and performance uh, when it comes to diapers um, and the absorbency and, and, and helping parents get the most sleep possible. And when making kudos, it was really important to me that we really focus on getting rid of as much plastic out of the diaper as possible because believe it or not, diapers are actually the third largest contributor to landfill waste. And so it it really matters what is touching baby's skin um, and while at the same time helping the environment and at the same time making sure you have stellar performance on with your diapers. And we chose cotton because um, it's naturally soft, it's sustainable. And in fact, the cotton that we use in our diapers is carbon negative. We source it from Mississippi right here in the US. And cotton is actually the number one doctor recommended material, um, especially for 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 babies that suffer from rash um, and eczema and have very sensitive skin. We have spent over two years developing our patent pending double dry technology, um, which is what really gives our diaper the absorption um, that, that it does have. And which, what does that mean for sleep? It means no more waking up at 3 a.m. to deal with overnight leaks. So we really do know that a good diaper can make all the difference when it comes to how much you and your baby are sleeping. So I do hope you'll join us in our breakout room where I am more than happy to dive in every technical question um, that you would ever want to know uh, for a diaper engineer and hopefully help you prevent leaks. And here is, um, 
here is the the diapers that we we just launched with in June and um and I'm happy to go into all the materials on them. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was amazing. Um, thanks for giving that brief intro. Like I said, you can go learn more um, in their booth for kudos and um, hope you'll have a chat with her later today. And now we're going to turn it over to Jenny. Jenny. Hey, great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to unpack uh, some great takeaway for everybody. I'm Jenny June. Uh, I've been doing this for 10 years as a certified sleep consultant in private practice in Los Angeles. I'm duly certified. I've, um, you know, education on both a holistic approach and even, you know, more of like the evidence, you know, the science-based stuff and, you know, all of that and everything in between. Um, I am a sleep geek, um, you know, I, I confess. Um, and uh, I love what I do. I'm also um, a collaborative provider for the Breathe Institute in Los Angeles. And I, uh, you know, also uh, lecture for their courses on sleep hygiene as their sleep hygienist um, in PD in the pediatric uh, part of their their work there. And and um, I am also a certified lactation counselor and feeding specialist, which is a very important part of uh, any sleep plan. And we have to regard that we want to take this from a whole you know make this a whole child whole day approach when we're addressing sleep. And often at this young age, I think those things are all very connected, including those diapers and and all of those things. Uh, so I'm. I'm so happy to have, a, you know, this kind of collaboration because uh, we want to look at this, uh, you know, in a multidisciplinary way. Um, I'm also a mama four, which I call my street cred. Uh, they're all in their 20s now. Uh, I gave birth to four kids within six years and and I was, you know, in the weeds, man. And I, I know what it's like to be in a lot of the, uh, your, all, you know, your shoes out there. I've been a single mom. I've been a homeschooling mom for 14 years. Um, made it to the other side. I'm just a few chapters ahead in the same book y'all are in. Um, but uh, I happen to still love this work and uh, I've been I've been doing it a long time and I'm excited to really uh, unpack the four pillars of sleep hygiene for you, um, the science of sleep, and also look at the neurological habit loops, uh, the habits we form and how do we change those and create powerful new ones, um, integrating infant mental health and secure attachment, um, lactation, feeding goals, whatever they may be, even introducing solids and how that can work even with um, supporting your sleep plan, uh, depending on the age and stage of development. And we, I'm going to take questions from everything from third trimester pregnancy all the way through to, you know, eight, 10 years old, whatever you got going on there. Um, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, uh, you know, giving you guys some great takeaway. Okay. All right. And so now I'm going to let Jenny actually take it away and get into all the deep dive on everything sleep. Um, and she's just going to let me know that she can see her presentation. So here yeah. we We're go. All set. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Jenny June. Again, I, if you, I'm not sure if you already heard my, my intro there, but uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. It just kind of, you know, gives you the basics there of, uh, you know, what I broke down for you. I've been a uh, certified full-time sleep consultant for 10 years. Um, one of the first ones out there ba back in the day uh, and constantly, um, you know, diving into more education and as sleep science unfolds and, and I'm just obsessed with it. I'm an absolute self-professed sleep geek, uh, you know, and I uh, have hundreds of hours in um, additional CEUs from a variety of different modalities when it comes to sleep in pediatrics and adult sleep. Um, a collaborative provider for the Breathe Institute, certified lactation counselor, feeding specialist for 10 years, and also a mom of four. So next slide. All right, so we're gonna talk first about the effects of sleep deprivation. When people you know, are considering sleep training, um, you know, we used to think sleep was for the weak and I'll sleep when I'm dead and it's not that important. And we're now in a culture where we're on 24 seven. Um, and we become so sleep deprived ourselves as adults um, that it cognitively, cognitively impairs us to the point where we don't realize we're sleep deprived. Um, it's much like alcohol uh, impairment, um, the way that we're impaired when we have a couple of cocktails. Uh, we don't realize just how impaired we are. Uh, that's why a lot of people think that they can still you know, get behind the wheel of a car, take the keys and, you know, and drive home, which is not safe. Uh, you know, it's, it's actually something that, um, you know, we're not very aware of once we get into the habit of becoming sleep deprived. We don't realize it until it starts shutting down, um, you know, other areas of our health. Um, you know, our, our organs, our, our mental function, our relationships start to suffer. 
our overall well, well-being starts to suffer. And unfortunately, sleep-deprived parents don't recognize sleep deprivation in their own children. So, you know, it starts to become our normal, um, you know, when we have a family that's just not sleeping well. We, we, we end up just kind of uh, slapping Band-Aids on things in the moment just to survive the night or the nap or whatever's going on and and get stuck in that place. And and um, it shouldn't be the place that we, we call our normal. Um, you can see here the effects of sleep deprivation. They're quite serious, um, especially if you are a parent. You need that cognitive flexibility. You need to be um, able, you need that to be able to be fully attuned to your child to develop secure attachment and continue building and scaffolding upon that full attachment attunement, a very important component of infant mental health. And if we are cognitively impaired uh, to these degrees um, from our own sleep deprivation, um, we really aren't able to read their emotions and their needs as well as we otherwise would be. Um, there is, you know, you can see the the long list here and it goes in, a, you know, much deeper into this high risk behaviors even. Um, and I ask my clients sometimes, uh, you know, after, uh, uh, gosh, I think it was about seven years ago, I had a mom called me and um, she she admitted that she knew she needed to to do something because she had almost run off run off the road with her child in the car seat after picking him up from daycare. She was so sleep deprived and she realized that, you know, uh, you know, that was where, you know, she, the rubber met the road, you know, per se. So um, irritability, cognitive impairment, memory lapses, uh, you know, severe impaired moral judgment. Uh, severe yawning, hallucinations, symptoms similar to ADHD. And in fact, I work with a lot of these cases where kids are, you know, going in for evaluation or maybe have already been diagnosed with ADHD. And uh, once we get them well rested and we, we get at the root of the, the sleep issues, those uh, symptoms of ADHD go away within le less than a week, typically. Um, it's certainly within 21 days. So, uh, you know, a lot of kids, we, you know, it makes me wonder how many are being misdiagnosed and labeled for the rest of them li their lives, or maybe drugged even for the rest of their lives, thinking that they have ADHD. And, and the symptoms are exactly the same from top to bottom all the way through, um, you know, by the time they're three years old. So uh, something to be considered, uh, to, to consider here. Leading causes of sleep deprivation, most common, especially with parents, is sleep fragmentation. Sleep, sleep fragmentation is just as impairing as if we only got four hours of sleep at night or prolonged wakefulness uh, to, a, to an ex, a extended degree. Um, fragmented sleep is just when we have these little arousals. It's why we know that sleep apnea or people who snore or have structural or functional issues with sleep have serious, they suffer from serious sleep deprivation, it starts to impact their organs, um, you know, their ability to function and digest food and, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and all those things are starting, you know, we're starting to connect those things. Very connected. Fragmented sleep for a parent might look like when uh, we're getting up in the middle of the night multiple times with our child, even in a co-sleeping situation. A child, child only has under three and a half years old, only has sleep cycles that last 50 minutes, you know, give or take five minutes on either end. We're in different stages of sleep in each of those sleep cycles. Um, you know, we can be in a light active stage of sleep in stage one, and, and we're in deeper stages, you know, at the end of each sleep cycle in stage three or four. Um, our sleep cycles, adults, are 90 minutes long. So if, you know, those stages are happening within a 90-minute period for us, but in a 50-minute period for a child, we're waking each other up, fragmenting each other's sleep multiple times all night long. Um, it may feel good in the moment because you don't have to at least get up and go out and you know, leave the room and go into the nursery to attend to your child, but your still, sleep is still quite fragmented and sometimes even more so because it's happening more often. Um, the other thing is having, you know, the all night open bar going on if we're using that as our, our survival technique to get our kid back to sleep so we can get back to sleep past the biological need to have those calories around the clock, you know, as we get into older babies and toddlers and, and preschoolers. Um, it's, it's often that I see um, a lot of moms who are, uh, you know, still uh, breastfeeding their kids in the middle of the night at three, four years old. It's not uncommon at all. And it just becomes a habit and it starts to erode sleep quality for that reason. Fragmented sleep is one of the leading causes of sleep deprivation in, in most of us. Um, poor timing of sleep. We're going to get into that a lot in the four pillars of sleep hygiene. Um, and, and that can really, you know, it's not so much the hours, it is the timing of sleep that really matters. But if the timing of sleep is good, those hours are naturally going to be there. Um, mobile sleep, the brain in motion 
cannot experience the deep, restorative, slow wave sleep within the third stage of a sleep cycle. Just like when we are, uh, you know, out and about trying, you know, maybe if we're we're in a car going going for a drive and maybe we've fallen asleep in the car while our, our partner or our friend is driving the car on the long road trip, you're napping that car because of the motion, uh, even maybe some lights and sounds and things like that. It's not going to be as restorative. It might take the edge off. You'll still sleep but you won't be able to get those deep restorative components because the brain goes into a primitive protective response called first night effect or similar to first night effect when we sleep the first night at a hotel room on our travels. Um, it sort of stays a little more alert and aware wondering, you know, what is that noise? What is that movement? What is that sound? You know, is that a lion coming into the cave? I don't want to get into deep sleep if, you know, where you're completely paralyzed and can't do anything about it. So it's sort of a primitive protective response. So mobile sleep, such as a stroller nap, a car seat nap, um, can be, you know, baby carrier nap, um, past the age of four months old. Um, that's when nighttime circadian rhythms come into full maturity and they can get that deep, slow wave sleep for the first time. That's when we don't want any of the fragmentation. Uh, we want to reduce that and start eliminating that. And we want to make sure that they're sleeping in the correct environment to get that deep, slow wave sleep. Because that's where the human growth hormone is produced. It's where the microbiome system is connected. The ability to produce good and healthy bacteria in and on the gut and absorb the nutrients from our foods and digest food well. So one of the common threads that I see um, with babies and, and adults even uh, who are sleep deprived or who aren't getting whole healthy restorative sleep cycles for what any of these three reasons is um, poor digestion issues, poor eating uh, situations, GERD, reflux, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, all those things are very connected to poor non-restorative sleep because within 48 hours of our sleep being fragmented or being, you know, just poor timing, such as shift worker syndrome or, or something like that, or, you know, sleep being mobile, you know, trying to sleep on the red eye on your way to New York, you know, to, to think it, thinking you're going to get up, you know, get off the plane and go to your 8 a.m. meeting and, and you realize you're just a hot mess, even though you slept on the plane, you feel kind of groggy. Um, you know, all of those things within 48 hours, um, if, if you've continued sort of that trajectory of the way you're sleeping or your baby is sleeping poorly in a sense for in 48 hours, we become chronically sleep deprived and that puts our bodies in a chronic state of stress. And then we start seeing the digestive issues, light snacky feeds at the breast all day long, um, sort of struggling with solid foods, um, you know, being kind of uh, finicky, picky with their eating, um, only able to take small amounts at a time, many times throughout the day. And sometimes just, you know, and even when they do get those small amounts, their body doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, it's just not comfortable to digest that. That's the first physical thing that's impacted as a result of the chronic stress that we go into when we're chronically sleep deprived. And it happens very fast. So one of the benefits of well sleep, of improving the quality of these sleep cycles, um, and sometimes that means sleep training, and we're going to dive into different behavioral methods and such. But one of the benefits is, is that I see um, dramatically improved situations with the eating and the digestion. Reflux starts to go away. They start, you know, improving their um, their intake and they crave healthier foods. And um, it's pretty amazing. So, um, you know, we want to ask ourselves what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And oftentimes it's the well sleep that needs to be the foundation of um, proper digestion and, and the ability to desire and want to eat nutritious foods and or um, protect positive breastfeeding behaviors and milk supply. Um, you know, so there's a way to have it all. We don't have to give up one area of health and safety to have another. Um, so this is a little, little bit there on uh, sleep deprivation, the effects of it, and the leading causes of sleep deprivation. So moving on to the next slide, Tracy, thank you is the four pillars of sleep hygiene. This is the foundation of well sleep. Um, this is, these are my trademark four pillars, uh, that I have been, um, successful with, uh, integrating into sleep plans um, and helping people improve their sleep quality, whether it's a baby, a child, or an adult. Um, since 2011, 2012, I think is when I trademarked it. Um, but, but it really breaks it down in a way that's really easy to follow. So I put a comprehensive detailed plan together for a family, but these are the main components. And if this foundation isn't underneath your chosen behavioral sleep training method. That sleep training method will be very short-lived if it comes together at all. And it'll be met with a ton of additional unnecessary 
tears of struggle, you know, as they're learning that new skill and adapting to your, you know, to your, your new parenting response. So this is essential. This is what ensures that um, your results are sustainable and permanent and long term. It is the foundation of well sleep. Um, so I'm going to unpack those for you very briefly in the amount of time we have here. You're going to get the little bit of the condensed version here, but it'll help you understand kind of why this is important. Um, the sleep environment, essentially, we need to recreate what nature gave us to sleep in in the first place. Cool, dark, and quiet. You know, we want to keep it nice and cool in the room. 60 to 71 degrees, we tend to, um, you know, ensures that we, we have elevated levels of melatonin. So the cooler the air is in the room, the more melatonin we produce. Um, and that's for children and adults. Um, and, you know, it's actually an added protective measure against SIDS. 60% of SIDS cases are directly related to babies who are overheated in their sleep environment. Um, you want to, you know, make sure that they're in breathable, um, you know, full arm, full leg cotton pajamas, a good sleep sack. The love to dream is a great one. Um, and, uh, sometimes it's helpful to keep the socks off the feet because we do regulate our core body temperatures from the top of our head and the bottom of our feet. Uh, so that might be uh, something you'll need to do if your temperature range is on the higher end there. Um, but it certainly is helpful. Um, keeping it dark in the room. The optic nerve is very sensitive. And even with the eyelids closed, it can tell if there's a glow of light coming from the edges of the blackout drapes um, or your closed blinds. Um, in stage one of each of our sleep cycles, we're all awake for about one to seven minutes. We just don't know that we are. It's a very light, active behavioral stage of our sleep cycles. We're moving around, talking, mumbling. Babies will cry or scream out, which seems like forever when it's happening, you know, even one to seven minutes at the top of every sleep cycle at night, um, you know, and uh, the eyes open up at the same time. They flutter open and close. If those open eye gates, if that optic nerve catches the slightest streak of light or glow coming from the edges of your blackout drapes or the indicator light on your baby monitor or a night light on in the room, it's enough to arouse your child or yourselves all the way awake, fragmenting that sleep, preventing the seamless transition from stage one sleep into deeper stage two and stage three. And we don't want any unnecessary fragmentation of sleep happening beyond their behavioral habits, maybe where they're getting up and needing, you know, believing that they need you to come in and, and do something to help them connect back to sleep. Uh, so if we can really get a handle on the temperature and the, the light in the room and have a good quality white noise machine in there to condition any stimulating sounds that could be coming from their bedroom window or outside their bedroom door, um, you know, to prevent that, those, those additional arousals. Um, it's very helpful in getting a handle on, um, you know, the quality of their sleep. Um, the second pillar of sleep hygiene is the sleep cues. Um, this is important. Um, this is where a lot of people get this, this one wrong, believe it or not. Sleep cues are what we need to be paying attention to. Oftentimes in the beginning, just so that we have the evidence with our own two eyes to be able to see when our children need to be going to bed at night. And sleep cues really should only be followed for night sleep, not day sleep. Day sleep is a radically different animal. If you're looking at these overtired cues and all the sleep cues during the day, you're going to be completely off with those naps. Um, and that's, uh, I see a lot of that today. A lot of people are very confused about that. Uh, day sleep is about resetting the internal body clock and mastering and optimizing those opportunities that uh, collide or coincide with circadian rhythms. But when it comes to those night sleep cues, um, a lot of parents think that, you know, when they see their kids rub rubbing their eyes, arching their back, squawking a bit, irritable, cranky, loud, and uncooperative, they think, oh, Lord, child, you're a hot mess. Let's, you're tired. Let's get you ready for bed. And they start that routine, that pre-sleep routine. Unfortunately, when you see those things already at that point, at the end of the night, those are actually not sleep cues. Those are uh, overtired cues or what you would call a cortisol burst. Um, and we, we weren't able to, or we, we weren't aware of what the true sleep cues look like so that we could obey those and have them in their, in their optimum environment to help build up melatonin and, and kickstart it and keep it nice and high so that the brain and body want to do the sleeping. Those hormones are everything. And we push them past those, those important cues that we, that we should be paying attention to. And we see them get those sort of overtired signs. That's a cortisol burst. And cortisol is a hormone. Um, it is a wakefulness hormone. It's designed to keep us awake and focused and productive throughout the day until it's time for sleep again. Um, but we don't want to do that at 
you know, at bedtime. Uh, when we aren't obeying our body's hormonal cues for sleep, it thinks we're needing to go into fight or flight. You know, we must need to hunt longer. We must need to, you know, run for our lives or or freeze or, or you know, do something. And so it will give you the hormones to help you do that if you're not obeying or you're not helping your obey, your, bo- your baby obey their, their hormonal cues for sleep. And it'll give you a, a big shot of cortisol, that wakefulness hormone, and it'll be accompanied by adrenaline. So I call that the toxic insomnia cocktail. Those two get up and have a party and and then boy, good luck. At, you know, you, you can keep your baby up so late that they eventually crash due to exhaustion, but they'll still crash without enough melatonin at sleep onset. And that is the secret sauce to ensuring whole healthy sleep cycles is an abundant amount of melatonin, their own natural production of it at sleep onset. And sleep is 100% about the brain and hormones four months and beyond. Uh, four months of age and beyond. It has nothing to do with the, how much food is in the stomach or not. Those are old wives' tales. Um, so the cues we want to be looking for are what I call relaxed state cues. And that's when you're going to notice that your baby or yourselves, your your motions are slower, you're less vocal. So your baby or your child might be really quiet and really still. They may be just completely disinterested in their surroundings. You may see them just stare off into space, really chill. And a lot of parents are like, Jenny, I don't think I've ever seen my kid get that, you know, relax like that, you know, or chill out like that. And that's because oftentimes it is happening so much earlier than parents anticipate. And it's very brief window. It's only about 10 to 15 minutes. And then they catch that second wind and then boom, they're wide awake, bouncing off the walls. And you're jumping through hoops for an hour and a half just to do all the work for them. And, uh, and you know, when they when we miss those cues and we, we get them to bed finally, however that is, you know, beyond those import, that important window, uh, that's where we, we, we see a lot of fragmented sleep at night. That's what the causation is of that. Um, or extra early waking without the ability to connect back to sleep. So it's very important to be aware of what melatonin looks like when it's peaking out in the system. All right. And then the pre-sleep routines. This is Pre-sleep routines and and the fourth one is the timing of sleep. Those are how we anticipate these brief cues so that by the time we see them, we're already done with the meal, the pre-sleep routine, and we're laying them down awake and aware in that that crib or that bed so that their brain and body are flooded with those powerful hormones and want to do the sleeping. That's what reduces the the temporary struggle when we apply our behavioral sleep training method. So those pre-sleep routines, that third pillar, these are powerful tools if they are performed correctly. They serve two important functions. They help kickstart melatonin production and they signal to the brain and body that sleep is about to come, which is also the essence of routine. It's what provides a foundation of emotional well-being for your child as they start to recognize the predictable patterns leading up to something they might not like to have to do, like take a nap or go to bed. And it's very normal for them to express their preferences and tell you they think your new sleep rules suck and push back. And, and unfortunately, what happens there is parents, um, you know, they struggle to discern the difference between tears of temporary struggle and tears of actual suffering, which we would immediately respond to, right? And they get reactive because we're in a culture now where we think all tears are toxic stress and they're going to melt their brain cells, destroy attachment. And, you know, God forbid we should end up visiting them in the state penitentiary by the age of 12. You know, should we, you know, let them fuss or cry? And and we try to talk them out of their emotions during this pre-sleep routine. We get in their face and we shush them to death or we, we add something to the routine or we take something away from it. And then there's no consistency in that routine anymore. And then the child doesn't really have a predictable, steady place to down-regulate and express their normal human healthy preferences around having to do something they don't like to have to do, like take a nap or go to bed. And it's normal for them to not like that because they're too little to understand the reason why they're sleep deprived is, you know, or feeling so miserable is because they're sleep deprived. Just like they're too young to understand why they've got to be confined in that car seat, you know, face in the rear, not able to see you or touch you for however long it takes to get off the freeway, you know? Uh, But, you know, that's where we have to strengthen our parenting instincts and also hold space for our children to feel their normal feelings and provide a sure, steady, predictable pattern for them to rely on while they're down regulating and supporting them through that. Um, And then all of a sudden they start to yield to these amazing routines and it becomes something they look very forward to. Um, So there's specific routines I put in place. um, You know, when I, when I work with a family or in my course uh, that I offer that are incredibly powerful 
and they're brief so that they don't catch that second wind and and we're not dragging the routines out because the anxiety leading up to something that we don't like to have to do is always worse than the event itself. So the longer the routine typically gets you into trouble. So there's specific time frames, there's specific things that I like to do in a routine that optimizes melatonin production and completely sets your child up for success in every way possible and also ensures that the last thing that they remember before they fall asleep or relax before they fall asleep is that they I did it myself. And that's what translates in the middle of the night is they're connecting from one sleep cycle to the next or short of a complete nap, being able to lengthen and stretch that nap. So very powerful pre-sleep routines in my in my program. Uh, but that's the reason why they need to be there. Uh, the, the timing of sleep is the fourth pillar and the timing of sleep, believe it or not, is far more important to regard than obsessing over how many hours of sleep our children are getting or we're getting. And to wrap our mind around this logic, it's helpful to look at jet lag syndrome or shift worker syndrome. If you know somebody who's awake and working, you know, like a, you know, doing their shift, like a physician or a firefighter, a FedEx worker, they're awake and working when they're doing their shift, you know, at their night shift. And they may come home afterwards and they get all eight hours of sleep in during the day. All the hours are there, but they still wake up a hot mess. They feel really groggy, non-restored. They need, you know, 12 pots of coffee and a nap just to make it through the day. And then they're overtired very early on in the night and, you know, push their bodies past those cues because they've got stuff to do, you know, maybe go to work again or whatever. And, um, and then they then fall into what's called insomnia. Poor sleep begets more poor sleep. So it's really important to understand um, why the timing is so, is so critical. Um, people who do chronic shift worker syndrome or who have poor sleep hours have higher rates of immune issues. They catch every little cold and virus and things coming down the pike. Their, their immune system is a little compromised there. Um, they have higher, higher rates of chronic illness, higher rates of mental health issues, and even higher rates of drug and alcohol abuse are more prevalent in the shift workers population. And that's because the brain sleeping outside of its natural biological rhythms cannot experience that deep restorative slow wave sleep that I was talking about earlier. I affectionately call it sleep crack. It's the magic stuff that parents pay me to get for themselves when they want to sleep train their kid. Uh, you know, we'll pay anything, do anything for it. It is um, a stronger biological drive for survival to get that than even the need to eat. We can survive without three weeks before without food before we succumb to death, but we will die in three to six days without sleep or water. So the drive, the biological drive for survival is stronger to get that important, healthy sleep. Um, and, and it is definitely the case for our babies. They are tripling the rate of growth and development between birth and three years old. The human growth hormone is produced only in that slow wave sleep. So we need to really guard that. It is a health and safety issue, just as much as nutrition and car seat safety and hygiene and all those other things. Um, so the timing of sleep is very important. Um, and we're going to dive into, um, you know, a little few tips in a moment at the end of this, uh, giving you some tips for daylight savings and how important it is to, you know, be ready for that and know how to get on the other side of that um, quickly. Um, but uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, we're going to talk about the behavioral sleep training methods and really what's happening when we're when we're using one, why we might need to use one. I work with all methods and I let my parents choose which method they feel is the best match for their unique child and, and family um, because if it doesn't feel good to them, they're not going to be able to be consistent with it. So I want it to feel good to them and I want them to have that choice. And you know your child, your baby better than anybody. And temperament, age, past field sleep training attempts in the background, your own sleep deprivation, these things really um, are important determining factors, especially temperament in what method will be a better match for your unique child. Um, and nobody knows that baby better than you. Not me, not your pediatrician. You are the mom, the dad. You know, you the parent know, know best. So, um, and every single time parents intuitively seem to pick the right method, which is super exciting to see. And I loved seeing them get excited, you know, and st it strengthens your parenting instincts, knowing that you, you did that um, and, uh, and seeing the outcome be so amazing. Uh, so it's important, uh, you know, to really not all, you know, not all, it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, it needs to be done correctly. You know, there's a lot of great methods out there. I work with all of them, but some of them, um, you know, the key is performing them well. Um, and sometimes we can get to a point where we demonize certain methods as being bad or good or dangerous or, you know, ineffective or whatever. Um, but it's kind of like breastfeeding. 
You know, if, if the latch doesn't come together right out of the gate in the hospital or soon after you get home, mom and baby are going to have a miserable experience. It's not going to go well, but we don't demonize breastfeeding for that reason, right? It's just that it wasn't performed well. So in my course and in my private work, I break down how to perform these methods correctly, where it gets you on the other side of it very quickly. We address the neuro habit and, and it comes together for the child with ease. Um, so there's certain ways to do certain methods and certain ways that maybe aren't quite so effective. Um, you know, the four pillars of sleep hygiene is the most important thing to, uh, the most important foundation to build your sleep training method from. Now let's talk about what these methods do. And you'll see on my slide here that I have um, the what's called a habit loop or a neuro habit in a diagram there. So you'll see cue, routine, reward, and craving. So in Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habits, which is a book I read when it first came out, it just blew my mind. It really put the cookies on the bottom shelf on the, in, in the form of neurology and how our habits are formed and how we create powerful, positive new habits. Um, and essentially, this is what it breaks down to. Um, there is a cue. Uh, and a cue, when we wake up in the middle of the night, when a human being wakes up in the middle of the night, whether it's a baby, you know, a four-month or older baby or a, an adult, um, the very first thought, what's the very first thought that we have when we wake up in the middle of the night? short of a complete night's sleep or a complete sleep cycle. It's usually something like, oh, crap, I'm awake. Oh, no, I'm awake. And you're just like, oh, no, you know, you know, it's not a good thing. So the first thing you think is something like, oh, crap, I'm awake. The very next thought that you have after, oh, crap, I'm awake is typically not, I got to go to the kitchen and make a sandwich, right? And it's not, you know, I got to wake up my partner and have them rub my butt till I go back to sleep. Although they may be totally down for that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's usually, oh crap, I'm awake. I got to get back to sleep fast, you know, to the point where we are willing to do anything to get that connection back to sleep. So our sleep is not fragmented and we can get that yummy sleep crack called slow wave sleep, right? And this is where we, we have a routine that we go through that we're so efficient at, we figured out what to do. Or we go through a little routine. I like to, you know, fluff my pillow, change positions, find a cold spot in the bed, you know, maybe hog some covers and I connect back to sleep. You know, everybody has kind of their own unique way of doing that. But um, certainly that routine is what we do. And, and if we're practiced at it and if it's working for us to get back to sleep, we can do it. We do it so fast and efficiently that we don't realize we're even doing it. We don't really fully arouse. And that routine right now uh, for a lot of parents or for a lot of babies, um, they maybe are still um, believing that they need to have their parent do this work for them. So they'll cry out, mommy, mommy, come here and put that boob in my mouth. Or, you know, or maybe they are conditioned to believe they need a warm body next to them in order to connect back to sleep. And, and get that yummy reward in, in the neuro habit of sleep cycles, um, of connecting sleep. Um, and so they don't know yet that they can do this, getting from cue to reward even better and faster than you can do it for them until we set them up for success with the four pillars of sleep hygiene, the hormones to be able to do it, the emotional well-being to be able to do it, all their needs met, and then using a behavioral sleep training method to put a new routine in there um, help them discover that they can do it, which is generally where we take the step back uh, to a different, you know, depending on the method you use, it's to certain degrees or another, take the step back so that the child can take the step forward and discover that they can do it. And the only difference between um, all these different sleep training methods out there is really parental engagement. How much of that do you want to have in the temporary struggle process as they connect from cue to reward and discover that they can get back to sleep even better and faster than you can do it for them. Now, when they do accomplish this, and practice makes perfect, we've got to have the hormones to do it. That's why the four pillars are so important. When they start realizing that they are doing it, they're getting back to sleep, and it happens very fast, something awesome happens. It ushers in what's called the craving, and you'll see that there. The craving is that slow wave sleep, that yummy sleep crack. It feels so good. It tastes so good, especially if you've been deprived of it, that, you know, your body, your brain just clings to it. And all of a sudden, you've created a new neuro habit, a new habit loop is formed. And it just improves upon itself and it gets better and better very fast because it is a strong biological drive for survival. So the brain and body are going, uh, yeah, let's get it. Let's get some of that, you know, and it works for your child to do that. And it feels good to your child. So it creates the natural incentive 
to want to continue these independent sleep skills that eliminate or reduce dramatically that fragmented sleep and helps them experience, you know, this healthy restorative, these healthy restorative sleep cycles, containing that slow wave, uh, you know, with that human growth hormone there and uh, all the things that they need to thrive and survive and, and um, move forward into the second stage of infancy and beyond in toddler preschool years. That slow wave sleep is also, it acts like a lymphatic system to the brain. It's what clears waste and toxins and stress that build up on this vital organ every 24 hours. Um, you know, we need that. Um, it's also what helps us regulate our emotions. Very important for toddlers and preschoolers. The prefrontal cortex and the amygdala need to be able to communicate. And it can only do that when we're getting important whole healthy sleep cycles. It, it struggles to do that when we're sleep deprived. It stays into fight or flight. And they're operating off of adrenaline for their energy the 24 hour, the rest of the day when they wake up in the morning if they're not well rested. So um, that's essentially how um, habits are formed, how we can change them, and where your behavioral sleep training method fits into this equation after we've set it up for success on those four pillars of sleep hygiene. It is what becomes the new routine. We keep the same cue. We keep the same reward. We just change the routine that connects the two together. And by the way, this is how Alcoholics Anonymous works. And this is how NFL football teams learn to win Super Bowls. So interesting little uh, trivia there. All right, next slide. Oh, let's see, Tracy? Uh-oh, maybe she can't hear me. Well, I will start talking about that next slide here. Let me pull it up. Oh, there she is, perfect. All right. So let's talk about, um, you know, we talked about the timing of sleep um, and sleep routines. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there's an important morning routine that needs to happen. And it, again, goes back to the optic nerve. This is, you know, what helps us to sync our sleep with natural biological rhythms and make sure that we're sleeping within the right timing, that we can adjust well to time zone changes when we're traveling and daylight savings. So a couple of things there. Uh, we've got daylight savings coming up uh, November 7th and today's the 20th. Um, I'm starting to rec rec uh, uh, recommend to my clients I'm working with now and, and for the next week or two that um, it's helpful, um, you know, if we start delaying our retrieval times in the morning by 30 minutes. Just start doing that now. We're already starting to see the effects of the time changing. The sun is um, rising a little bit later in the morning and it's setting a little bit earlier. And if we get a good week or so of just, um, you know, them getting used to waking up a little bit later for maybe 30 minutes later for right now, then it'll be a really easy natural shift. You won't really have to do anything. You can go right to it. Uh, the new uh, time zone as it, as it unfolds on us um, on the 7th and not have to do anything more after that. Just letting option one there that you see is letting the optic nerve do its job naturally. That's actually how we all adjust as adults. Um, I, you know, get, you know, when I had four kids, if somebody told me I had to, you know, adjust 15 minutes ahead on the clock each day, four days in advance, my eyes would have glazed over because I was barely surviving you know? <laughs> and I'm not good at math. So, I mean, that's why uh, I, I give those options. Option one, option two, I do have a lot of moms that just really prefer to do it that way. And that's great. We want to do what works for you uh, so that it's easy and, and you get on the other side of it. Uh, 15, adjust the clock 15 minutes ahead each day, four days in advance of that time zone uh, or that time. Uh, um, daylight savings happening. And same thing applies uh, in the spring when we when we uh, move fall forward and the time changes there, you would just do it the, on the opposite end. Um, and the optic nerve does do the work for you. Um, that's something again, that goes back to our four pillars and understanding how that informs the hypothalamus and the pineal gland and all those things that produce cortisol and melatonin. We need to have a good balance of that. Getting outside, exposing um, the optic nerve to the early morning rising sun in the morning as a first part of your morning routine. There's a distinctive blue hue that comes up with early sunrise. Um, like no other time of day, um, you can tell without anybody telling you what time it is. If you were to see what, you know, morning sunlight looks like and that somebody puts you in front of, you know, uh, a two o'clock in the afternoon sunlight, you would be able to tell. You'd be able to guess pretty well which one is the morning. There is a distinctive blue hue. And when that's coming up with early sunrise, that's what the optic nerve sees. And it says, hey, happy thalamus, it's, it's morning time. This is the morning light. We need to produce a ton of cortisol up in here in order to, uh, you know, be able to be productive and focused and function throughout the day until it's time for sleep again. 
and it really is what you know that regulation and that 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 system of of balancing cortisol and melatonin is what helps us um, sync our sleep with natural circadian rhythms. So uh, get up in the morning, get at least 20 minutes of exposure as the sun is rising. Um, you know, get your child up, get outside for a 20 minute walk if you can. Dress for the weather. Um, even you know, uh, you know, in the northern regions of you know the UK where I work with a lot of clients and Canada and um, all over the place, I sometimes get some folks in Alaska that I work with virtually, and and they get this. They understand that you know this is an important part of of being able to have the energy you need to function well and you know be cognitively flexible through the day but it's also what we need in order to sleep well at night it acts like a basic circadian rhythm light therapy if you will so it's a good morning routine especially once this time changes to as soon as the sun starts to rise usually around 7 a.m uh, to get outside after your your breakfast or whatnot and and uh, hang out for a while go walk the dog or have a little nature walk and enjoy whatever weather may come uh, just dress for the weather and and expose that optic nerve. It's also the early morning safe rays of the sun. In some places, we're still getting some of that sunlight or even through cloudy, stormy, rainy days, we can still get that UVB. And that particular um, time of morning, it's the safe rays of the sun. This is what helps us to absorb the most potent form of vitamin D that we could possibly give our, our children or ourselves, um, far more so even than any synthetic supplement. And that vitamin D, we know, is very important in protecting our immune system. And we need that more than ever today. Um, but that vitamin D is also what protects iron stores. And iron is directly related to sleep issues at night. People who have low levels of iron in their blood or anemic, they have horrible issues with sleep at night and oftentimes sleep disorders as a result. Restless leg syndrome is one. Uh, so we can do a lot of um, you know, good for our night sleep or our children's night sleep if we have a good morning routine when we wake up and getting outside for 20 minutes. If, if you can do it on a weekend a little bit longer than that, that's even better. But a minimum, minimum of 20 does the job and it will certainly save you on daylight savings. So I hope that information is some good takeaway. I do have a PDF with more detail there, um, referring back to the four pillars of sleep hygiene uh, that you can get from um, my assistant Bree in my um, at my booth here at this event. Um, you can also schedule a, um, and I think you can go to the go ahead and go to the next slide, um, Tracy. Thank you. So I've got a sleep training course for toddlers and big kids, really 16 months old to about seven years old. It covers everything crib to bed transitions, potty training, um, you know, all the crutches you can imagine out there. The four pillars of sleep hygiene are broken down into great detail, giving you a solid sleep plan, soup to nuts, everything you need. There's a great troubleshooting session in module five. The whole course is only two hours long um, and it's self-paced. You can take it, you know, as, you know, as little as much as you want. Um, there's some great downloadables, some extra support and a 30 minute call directly with me if you want to go to the elite package. Um, but the main one is, is $99. It's there for you. I also um, it would encourage you um, to, you know, just schedule a 15-minute uh, uh, discovery call directly with me. You can schedule that on my website, jennyjune.com. And uh, we'll unpack your unique situation together. And um, and if you'd like to move forward from there on a private level with me, you can also do that. My services and pricing page is all in full disclosure on my website as well. And um, I'm happy to help you and meet you right where you're at and create a customized uh, plan, sleep plan that includes a feeding protocol, whole day, whole child approach. Um, but uh, it, it goes into a lot more depth uh, that, than what we're able to do here. But that gives you a little teaser and some good takeaway, I hope, in understanding how uh, sleep architecture and physiology works and how habits work and how important all those four pillars are to um, well sleep. And anybody can do that. So, um, all right. Uh, the next slide, I think, is just my contact information. And I think um, you can see that there. Um, please follow me on Instagram. I haven't done such a good job of, uh, you know, working on that. I've always been a Facebook girl. So now I'm paying for it. And I, so if you can give me a follow there, that would be great. <laughs> But I'm, uh, I've am i got Bree just putting out some great content there, some uh, going into depth into all these things that we talked about. And um, and I'd love to have your your feedback, your comments on that and uh, and tell me what you think and maybe throw some uh, your your unique situations my way. I'll be able to answer those for you. Uh, so that's my info. And I'd love to take questions. I think, Tracy, you said we were going to do that now or maybe on the main stage later, correct? I'm back. I'm back. Hello. <laughs> All right. Um, we are going to take questions, as we said. Hold on. I'm going to get rid of our um, 
screen. So we have your face that we can see. Um, and we're going to ask if anybody has questions that they want to post. I think they're going to, Sarah's going to help us post them, grab them from the chat. Um, so for people who are in the event, you can just use the chat on the right side and type in any questions you have and, um, Jenny will answer them. So, um, but I can start us off with a question while we're going to get questions from Sarah. Um, so does like, do you, does the time change sort of theory apply to things like holiday travel or like when you're, you know, going through time zones or you have family in town or you're doing different things. I think a lot of people are also preparing for sort of this disruption. It's a happy disruption, but like nevertheless a disruption. Like I know we're going to Hawaii for the holidays, um, for example, where it'll be significantly earlier than here. Mm -hmm. um, and I know like some people I feel like always like put their kid on the new time right away. Or some people are like, I'm not leaving LA time. So what do you recommend when you're yeah. in those situations? Great yeah. question. Yeah, the same concept applies. The optic nerve is what does a lot of the work for us when we are adjusting time zones with travel. Uh, when you are traveling with a, uh, a baby over, I would say probably over five months old or over four months old, five months old, um, and you know you're going to be in the destination of your, your travel destination for longer than three or four days, it is really a good idea to avoid the red eye, protect their night sleep at all costs if you can. If you can, it's not always possible depending on where you're traveling. Um, uh, but uh, if you can travel in the morning um, and protect their night sleep, uh, when, when you land at the time zone of your destination, sink right to that time zone of where you're landing. Um, no matter what, you, the optic nerve, like I said, is already informing your brain wh what's happening. The light, the rising and setting of the sun and the way the earth rotates on its axis is really uh, <coughs> what does the work for us. Our body clock is attuned to that. And we'll make that adjustment typically with, you know, some, some kids adjust very quickly or adults very quickly. Um, it, sometimes it can take three or four days. Um, but going right to it, especially the following morning when you wake up in that destination of your travels, get up, get your child up between 6 and 7 a.m. Uh, look on your phone and just kind of discern what time the sun's rising at whatever time of the year or your, your location that you're, you're at. And make sure you are outside with your child for at least 20 minutes. Um, each morning that you're there. And if you can extend it a little bit longer than that, maybe have breakfast al fresco, you know, at a sidewalk cafe and really expose that optic nerve to that distinctive blue hue coming up with sunrise. That's going to do the job. It's going to give them the energy to make it the rest of the day until the nap time or until bedtime without being a hot mess. And then the body will, will start adjusting um, when it digests food better and bowel movements and all of that will sink right to it. Okay. All right, good. We're going to try it. We'll try it and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me know. Call me from Hawaii. <laughs> I'll call you from Hawaii and let you know what's happening. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple questions. Let me start with those. Um, okay, I'm due with my first child in December. What tips, et cetera, can you recommend from birth forward, um, you know, to have in your sort of toolkit? I am so glad you asked that question. Um, is that, uh, who, who asked that question? I'm looking on the comments. Is that Autumn? Susan. Susan asked Susan. that question. Susan, congratulations okay. first on your, um, your, your soon to be uh, experience being a, a new mom. It's going to be very exciting and you're going to have a lot of stress. One thing I want you to take right off your shoulders is the sleep because babies are not born with a circadian rhythm. They are not born with the ability to produce melatonin on a timed basis. That starts to develop over the course of their fourth trimester and comes into full maturity for night sleep at 16 weeks properly dated from their birth date, not their due date. Um, so in, that me in the meantime, um, their sleep is designed to be light, active, sporadic, and disorganized so that they can easily resuscitate themselves should their fragile physical vitals fall below normal. Um, this is a time when we're stabilizing core, core body temperatures, respira respiratory systems, heartbeat rhythms, um, establishing positive breastfeeding behaviors and milk supply, establishing a secure, uh, a secure attachment, that foundation of trust from which we can then teach effectively later on when we do need to hedge them in with protective boundaries around health and safety issues such as sleep or nutrition or, you know, hygiene and all those things. Um, and they can adapt to change well because we've built that foundation. But rest assured, there is nothing you can do 
to create permanent bad sleep habits in this first four months of life. There's absolutely nothing I can't train out of your child. Their brain is going to shift dramatically at that point. Everything's going to change anyway. Um, there's nothing you can do to create permanent bad sleep habits. Do the best you can just to protect your own sleep at that point and get some, you know, there's some great products out there that you will help take the edge off to help you make it and help you keep your baby safe and, you know, sleep when, you know, when they can or however they can. Uh, don't worry about breaking any sleep rules. It does. It's not something you need to be concerned about at that early stage. But at four months, that's when we start seeing what's called a four month regression. It's actually not a regression. It's a progression in your baby's development for sleep. Um, and we just need to learn to evolve our care routines and parenting responses, maybe even the sleep environment, you know, moving into a, a standard size crib and all the safety things to meet and match their evolving, developing needs for sleep. And that's what we sometimes call a regression. It's just that we don't know how to or when to evolve our care routines. And it can quickly sleep deprive them if at that stage of development, we're still responding to them as we did when they were newborns, around the clock, on demand, doing a lot of things that could potentially fragment um, their sleep cycles once they come into full maturity later on. But don't worry about any of that in the first uh, four, or the, the first four months of the fourth trimester. You're in good shape. And all babies are different at this stage. There's an, it, you know, there's no one size fits all. Find your baby's rhythms. There's a lot of programs out there that tell you to do a certain way and it should look a certain way. And that will quickly sewer you and take you right down in a place you don't want to be. I get those calls all the time. And because, you know, every, this is different. Your baby's health is stabilizing itself and it's going to look di different for every baby at this point fragile early fourth trimester. So take a load off. It's it's not a reflection on you or your baby, how they're sleeping at that point. Awesome. All right. We have two people with seven month olds um, and uh, different questions. But so um, the first one is I um, have a seven month old baby. How do I get them to sleep in the crib through the night? They wake two to three times per night. I nurse him in bed and then put him back in the crib. Um, but lately he's been waking up on transfer back to the crib and ends up just sleeping in the bed. Yeah. Um, you know, I would love to do a, a 15 minute initial, you know, discovery call with you and kind of break these things down. It would really take a full, um, intake for me to see all the pieces of the puzzle there in context of your unique child. But I can kind of tell from what you're already mentioning there, that there's, um, uh, there's an association there where, you know, whatever conditions that we're using to fall asleep or relax to before we fall asleep. Um, or relax our child to, or get them all the way to sleep, whatever conditions they're, you know, they're doing that under when you put them down in the crib or they wake up or they segue from one sleep cycle to the next, they're conditioned to believe they need those same things in place in order to connect back to sleep. And so that's where uh, the routine component and that neuro habit uh, part of my slide there that we talked about, uh, it's about changing that routine of how, you know, what's the last thing they remember relaxing to or falling asleep to before they fall asleep, you know, or, you know, what, what are you doing at that point? Are you letting them do that work, relax themselves and connect to sleep on independently so that when they're waking up in the middle of the night, segueing from one sleep cycle to the next, the last thing they remember falling asleep to the last thing I remember relaxing to before going to sleep is I did that myself. And that's what that's what starts the, the the habit loop process. Oh yeah, and then they can do that even better and faster than you can do it for them. You know, once they get a few opportunities to practice that, and practice makes perfect. So it's like any other gross motor skill, like learning to walk or crawl or sit up and stabilize themselves in a sitting position. There's going to be some times when they fall over a couple. You know, they get a bump on the head. It's going to be some temporary struggle involved in that while we're they're learning and mastering that new skill. But again, practice makes perfect. And it is just temporary struggle, um, learning something new. And so, uh, you know, it's difficult um, when you're undergoing that and not sure what to do. And, and, you know, you hear this crying maybe or fussing or resistance. They have strong associations. They're tired and they just want to get back to sleep fast. And they think the only way that they can do that is if you're doing, if they got a boob in their mouth or they're laying next to you or you're doing it for them, they're going to be like, mom, come on, give me a break. Give me, give me that sleep. What are you doing? I don't, you know, what is this? And they're going to go cronk on you. So you want to be able to set them up for success in order to have the hormones to do what we're asking them to do and, um, and the emotional well being and all the needs met and everything. Um, and the brain and body are flooded with those powerful sleep hormones 
so that they you know can easily yield to that and then it starts to feel really good to them and then off you go uh, it's like any other gross motor skill that they're learning learning to do and and to do well so uh you know we can unpack the details of that and um talk about what it would look like for your unique child and different strategies about getting to that point um, again i offer all methods and i like to find the one that feels good to you and you feel is a good match for your child and then i coach you through it daily and on demand or uh, you can purchase the $99 course or the elite course where there's a little more support from me in that. Hopefully that yeah. helps. That was a very condensed an answer to your uh, big yeah, question. Well, obviously, I think as Jenny's saying, these are, you know, it's complicated. It's not, and it's, and it is not a one size fits all um, after, you know, the implementation, right, of your structure. Yeah. And so I think yeah. that's like a very important takeaway point that like, Obviously, you have to talk to them individually more. Um, someone else asked about uh, leaps, and you sort of touched on it earlier with regression. So they said about leaps, you know, that infants and toddlers go through as they develop, and how accurate is that, and how do we avoid sleep regressions at those times? Yes, I love this question. I hear this all the time. Oh, that we, we can't sleep train now because there, there's a regression, there's a leap, there's happening. Is it okay to it's never a bad idea to give your child sleep or any human being sleep when it's a biological drive for survival under any conditions. There are no conditions when it's okay to sleep deprive somebody or to allow them to experience sleep deprivation. And in fact, when there is a developmental shift, and the biggest one in the first three years of life, by the way, is around the skill of pulling themselves up into a standing position holding on to something, maybe cruising furniture while they're holding on to something and taking those first steps. That's absolutely life-changing for them. And oftentimes they don't get enough practice with that skill. So they'll lay in their crib at nap time and obsess about it or want to practice those skills in their crib rather than take their nap. And that's where we see that micro napping happen and them resisting sleep. And then if the naps aren't going well, that's definitely going to impact the quality of the night's sleep uh, because they're overtired even by an early bedtime, uh, you know, and then it's just going to cycle out of control from there. So really those four pillars of sleep hygiene, uh, the, the protocol, the schedule, the 24 hour a day schedule that includes when and how to practice those important gross motor skills that are new and on the horizon for your unique child at whatever stage of development that they're in, uh, the outdoor time, the, you know, the, the routines, the pre-sleep routines for naps, the pre-sleep routine for bedtime, um, you know, all these other things that, um, you know, need to come into play for your unique child at different stages of development. Those all play a significant role in getting them uh, through any potential uh, bumps in the road with those uh, developmental uh, leaps that you're talking about. And really, when when it's going well, you wouldn't even know they're happening. Um, they sleep beautifully regardless, and it actually helps facilitate these important leaps in, in, and um, achieving these new skills in their, in their development, especially the gross motor skills. And uh, they thrive, and you don't see interruptions to sleep typically. Or at least I don't, or my clients don't. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. You're a professional. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, we another, There was another seventh-month-old question, which I think is similar to maybe what you answered, but it was about um, starting at, she says that the baby is seven months, starting at three months, she started rejecting feeding, and she ended up feeding her only during a sleepy state in order to get her to feed. Now wow. she only falls asleep when she's eating. How does she separate feeding and sleeping? Yeah. Um, Yes. This is where we want to, you know, this is where we ask ourselves what comes first, the chicken or the egg. I work with a lot of GIs and, and you know, I work with a lot of very extreme cases where babies are on feeding tubes and, you know, they're, they're not even on the scale. They're born very low birth weight, a lot of multiples, a lot of issues where kids start rejecting food or rejecting the breast or whatever's going on. And the only time the parent can get them to, um, you know, bring them essentially out of their stress levels from the chronic state of sleep deprivation that really comes from the fragmented sleep at night, having to give them meals in the middle of the night, fragmenting that sleep. And then that impacts, then they got to, their body's got to stop what it's doing with the sleep and digest that meal. That child's going to wake up a hot mess, completely sleep deprived right out of the gate in the morning. No different than if you and I were to wake up and have a slice of pizza, you know, every time we had a, an arousal in the middle of the night, right? Or if we were to have a meal in the middle of the night once or twice and then try to go back to sleep, we're going to wake up sleep deprived. And then that's going to put us in a chronic state of stress. The digestive system is the first thing that's negatively impacted there. And now your child is really is going to eat even more poorly throughout the day um, because it can't handle even the small amounts of food. It doesn't feel good. The body can't digest it well. They're in fight or flight. And when we're in fight or flight, the last thing we want to do is eat and digest food. Um, uh, How Zebras Get Ulcers is a great book to read if you want to dive into the science of that. 
um, you know, just how the how all of that works and and the order of when it needs to work. So it's all about optimizing the master body clock. And my protocol in my sleep training program gets right down to it. We have to weave a feeding protocol that's going to support optimum eating and, and caloric intake and have help the body know what to do with it when it does eat. Digest that food beautifully. That's what's going to set the sleep up for success so that they can sleep. We can start the process of consolidating sleep at night and allow the natural consolidation of calories to start taking place during the day. And then all of a sudden, within by day four or five, your child is in homeostasis again and is doing beautifully with everything. And so you do not have to give up one area of health and safety to have another. If you understand how the power of the master body clock, and that's why my, my program is designed, whether you're doing the $99 course or working one-on-one -on -one with me in a private matter, um, you know, that is something that I make sure all of my, my families have. It's very important. Um, okay, next question. We're going to go through a few more and then probably we're going to send you guys to Jenny's booth to leave your, to leave more questions there for her to answer. Um, uh, just being conscious of time, but next question, any tips for toddlers, which I know you have, which is yeah. why Jenny launched her course, right? Because sleep doesn't magically get perfect just because your children get older, right? I can tell you for sure. My nine-year-old is not a good sleeper. Uh, uh, it's lifelong. So, um, any tips for toddlers? Uh, my daughter's really energetic at nighttime and probably all the time I'm guessing, you know, as a busy toddler, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, toddlers, a teenager, um, I had a mom say this to me, you know, you know, we sleep trained her when she was little, she was sleeping great. And all of a sudden she turned to, and a, you know, a, a, you know, a toddler is a whole different beast, right? So um, that's because at about 18 months, two years old, sometimes, you know, they don't throw this at you until they're about three, but they start just discovering their autonomy. They start to realize that they're not a part of you anymore. They're their own person. And this is an amazing opportunity for them to, to learn more about that. So they have a natural desire, natural stage of development for them to, to start discovering that. So they start to test boundaries and rules. They're curious about those things. Do they really mean anything? Do I have to follow them or not? Who's in charge? Uh, you know, they start noticing different positions and, and, you know, from their teacher to the students to mom and dad and who's in charge? Is it me or is it them? They have a curiosity about that. That's very healthy and normal. So it is normal for them to push back and, you know, on everything, especially the three things that we can't control, which are making another human being sleep. You can't make another human being do that. You can't make another human being eat and you can't make another human being put their crap in a toilet, right? So those are the three, th the, you know, the big threes that two nagers and three nagers and four nagers, you know, throw our way because they're curious about, you know, and, and we end up getting engaged in the battle oftentimes or uh, bargaining uh, Band-Aid techniques where we're doing sticker charts or sadly, even some parents, you know, put punishments in place, you know, around these areas and, you know, of trying to help them sleep or eat better, or all of those things, you know, potty training. And that's not the way to approach it. We want to assume the best of them. We want to give them reminder tools. We want to set them up for success with specific tools. Um, they love, um, you know, they love structure. They just, they're curious about it and they feel safe when you do put it in place, when they know you're a sure, steady, predictable place for them, you're setting them up for success in every way possible possible and then taking a step back so they can take the step forward and they see on your face that you know you believe that they can do it and you're not worried and you're not going backward on what you say you're you're holding um, space for them to feel their big feelings you let them know when they're throwing tantrums and fits during the pre-sleep routine that you accept these feelings and them just as much as you do when they are showing happy feelings and they're compliant right and they see that you know, I'm accepted in all these feelings and mom and dad are telling me that I can do hard things and they're, you know, and yeah, I am tired because of all that good sleep hygiene, you know, and then there's a variety of different tools that I offer parents to use. Um, again, I never use one size fits all sleep training method or routine in that, in that neuro habit. I offer a variety of different things um, for parents to choose from. It, it's got to feel good to you so you can be consistent for your child who is really curious about whether or not you're worthy of leading them or not. And we get the opportunity to be the first example to them of what healthy boundaries looks like. Healthy boundaries is not about controlling another person. We're not going to try and control your child. We're not going to try and talk them into liking their pre-sleep routine 
or doing the sleeping. We can only control ourselves, self-control. And we can control this routine I give you, the timing of sleep, the sleep environment, and your parenting responses, which only serve to be a reminder tool for them so that they can really um, learn that they can do this hard thing. And they and that's what develops self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the foundation of self-esteem. Um, so really, it's a it's a whole different ballgame with, you know, toddlers and preschoolers and older big kids. And that's why, you know, I specifically designed my course to really address all those unique factors. Um, you can certainly do private work with me if you like a lot. You know, a lot of parents are still wanting to just do that with me privately. Um, but that course is everything you need. Um, and I highly recommend it for ninety nine dollars. Um, okay, next question. I have two more I'm going to get through and then we'll um, send everyone out to the rooms. Uh, we live in beautiful gray Michigan from <laughs> October to April. Uh, what do you think would be more beneficial for my children's sleep routine, routine, 20 minutes of a light box in the morning or 20 minutes of sunrise walk during the winter? Uh, yeah, great question. I was just in Wisconsin, actually, in the uh, I think it was back in April when I filmed this course. Um, I, you know, sort of up in that uh, in that region, and I noticed it. Yeah, it gets a little cold up there, and it's you know a little gloomy and cloudy. I grew up in the Northwest myself, so you know we didn't we didn't see the sunlight usually till noon every day, and the, when the clouds would burn off. Uh, you know, I grew up in the Portland area, um, but uh, it's much better actually to get outside than having a light box because even though it's a cloudy day you're still getting and absorbing the UVB rays from the sun, even if the sun isn't showing. Um, and that is going to improve the absorption levels and, the, and the, uh, the depth of the vitamin D that your child gets. And that vitamin D is impro- important to protect their immune system and protect those iron stores. And that, th- that iron is directly related, related to quality sleep at night. So, um, you know, if it's a horrible, stormy, awful, you know, the weather is, you know, obviously too bad to go out in. Um, I actually would prefer even be beyond a light box, have your child um, playing in front of a sunny window in your home uh, where they're getting some exposure uh, to the to the natural sunlight or, you know, whatever we call it when the clouds are out, you know, <laughs> uh, when the sun is rising. And that's still going to help that optic nerve and, um, you know, even, you know, give them a little bit more vitamin D than a light box would. But if a light box is all that you have, um, something, the conditions are such that, you know, that's all you got to work with in that moment. Um, you know, that would be your next go-to, obviously. Okay. Uh, final question we're going to do, uh, my baby is breastfeeding. Um, and everyone's thanking you, by the way, they, they love oh. you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so happy. And it says very helpful just cause I know you're not like getting their feedback. So they are saying that this is very helpful and appreciative oh. of your time today as we all are. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to give you the final question for now. And then, like I said, Jenny has her brand room. So you can go in there and get more information and access resources, and all the links and all that good stuff. Um, okay, last question. My baby is breastfeeding and is a year old. Recently, she won't sleep more than two hours at a time or four hours um, at first and then wakes every two hours after that first four hour stretch, I think is what she's saying. Uh, what do you recommend? Yeah. So it depends on your breastfeeding goals. Um, you know, you don't need to take away breastfeeding. We don't, we just change the order of when it's happening a year old. They obviously don't need the calories around the clock to survive, thrive and sustain life like they needed when they were younger babies. Um, so it's become a sleep crutch, you know, uh, they, you might be using the, you know, the two glass of wine nightcap in order to help them relax or go to sleep, you know, like, uh, that, that sleep association where, you know, this is what relaxes them. It might be in your current pre-sleep routine. So those are the conditions that they expect to have in order to segue from one sleep cycle to the next is, you know, and where there's a slight arousal there and they don't know yet, your baby doesn't know yet, she can, she can connect back to sleep even better and faster than your breast can do it for her. Um, So, you know, that's the, again, going back to that sleep association, that routine component in the neuro habit, um, you, uh, you, this, it's time to consolidate calories at night or uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, consolidate sleep at night allow the natural consolidation of those uh, breast milk calories to consolidate during the day. Um, Once your master body clock, um, you know, at this point, you're a well-oiled milk making machine. Most of us have a harder time getting rid of our breast milk at this point than keeping it, you know? So, um, so at this point, your body just needs to, the master body clock needs to see that demand and supply and demand are happening in a different time. So it takes about 72 hours of when you do finally, you know, allow her to sleep and connect back to sleep without the milk. And you're now providing the milk during the day. 
Um, you know, she's getting all the same amount of calories. Nothing's being taken away there. She will consolidate and drink and consume a lot more if she has the incentive to do so because she's waking up well rested and she hasn't been eating all night long. So that's just going to naturally happen in, in, throughout the day. Um, and uh, when your body uh, starts noticing that demand is lessening at night, um, you'll start feeling a little engorged at first in the middle of the night, the times that you would normally feed your baby um, to take the edge off of that. Helpful tip, get yourself a square plastic bucket, something we might put our, our feet in and soak our feet in. You can get them at, you know, any uh, big box store. Um, and in the middle of the night, when you're starting to feel that really tight sensation, because that's when your body's, your body clock says, oh, we always give a feeding at, at night at this time. We need to, you know, we need to get ready and stock it up. You know, this baby's going to eat now, you know. So um, when that's happening and your baby isn't um, transferring milk at that time, you're going to feel a little engorged. Just take that foot bucket, go into your bathroom, uh, take down your nightshirt and fill that bucket up with warm water as warm as you can, you know, be comfortable with, and then lean over with submerging both breasts in that bucket of water as deep as you can up to the chest level and hang out there no pun intended, for about three to five minutes. And if you look down, depending on the color of that bucket, you'll see a streak, a stream, a very light, slight streak of milk flowing out into that water without you doing any extraction or signaling production. And that will take the edge off a little bit so that you're comfortable in getting through the, you know, three or four nights um, of, you know, you know, changing when your body clock is, is noticing demand for milk. Um, so, and also preventing mastitis and infections and, and all of that. And, uh, and then, you know, you might have to do that a few times at night, but um, certainly that will get you through and in a healthy way. And then all of a sudden your body is noticing babies taking those calories more during the day. So it will shift production and increase it during the day. And then all of a sudden it will let you sleep at night and not produce so much at night. So that's how that works. That master body clock is, is really amazing thing. All right. Thank you, Jenny, for answering so many questions. Like I said, um, I know some people maybe have more questions or missed it. So she um, has her booth and you guys can leave, um, you can leave your information there and get more information there. And, um, and all of the contact information and all of the downloads and other things. I know people are asking about missing parts of her talk today too. So there will be a replay after the event. We'll download the video. We will share it. Everyone on the list um, will get that information as well. And in that email, so everybody that's registered is going to get the email that tells you how to watch the replay. And then we're also going to enter everybody that checked in here today into our giveaways and you'll receive, um, the winners will get an email with the prizes. The prizes include, in case you didn't hear, oh, we have bad lighting. Um, we have three Love to Dream uh, sleep sets, which obviously are important. I know um, Jenny has, I think on her website too, maybe a list of products or other things that she recommends or can talk to you about. I know all the things that people have questions about related to products, but we have sleep sets for you from Love to Dream. We have a mattress from Naturepedic, which, you know, we all need to find uh, the right mattress for our cribs. Um, that's obviously key. And then Kudos is doing a diaper giveaway, which we definitely need as well. I'm sure everyone's going through a lot of diapers as are we here. Um, and we loved testing out their diapers. So strongly encourage you to go to their booth and chat with them and enter their giveaway as well. Um, thank you guys again so much. Thanks for participating. Thank you for the good questions. Thank you, Jenny, for your time and the excellent information. Um, and we will hopefully see everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank See you, you soon, everybody.